So it's my great pleasure to introduce a unique talent whose work I've admired for some time. Emily Mosier has a lifelong passion for railroads and their environment, especially stations and their architecture and artwork. Born with diminished visual acuity, her work focuses on the camera as an alternate eye, capturing the world in HDR and long exposures beyond the human eye's capability. Emily has traveled the world in her pursuit of interesting subjects from Metro North commuter railroads to Japan's cat trains to the partially abandoned railway in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. She has a popular railroad themed blog, I Ride the Harlem Line, which she's run since 2008. Emily's photography and writing have been featured in Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine, our own Railroad Heritage Quarterly Magazine, Metro North Publications, and more. She's been interviewed and featured in the New York Times, Atlas Obscura, and NPR, among many others. She plans to publish a book on the definitive history of the New York and Harlem Railroad one of these days. We writers know that phrase all too well, but I can't wait to see her pull it off. So today, Emily is sharing her dynamic coverage of Sweden's colorful cave stations, and you are in for a serious treat. Prepare yourselves for an eye-popping, jaw-dropping visual tour with stunning colors and photography. Take it away, Emily. Thank you so much, Elrond. Uh, let me share my screen here. So thank you so much, Elrond, for the uh, introduction. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be here today to uh, get to share an awesome train system uh, with you. Um, the uh, Stockholm Metro is something that sort of uh, captured my interest um, really from seeing photos on the internet. Um, and I pretty much went there um, just to uh, see these uh, train stations. Um, so the uh, Stockholm Metro is made up of uh, three lines, uh, red, blue, and green. Um, and across those uh, lines, there's 100 stations. Now, only five of those stations have no art. So um, you've got a transit system with 95% of uh, everything having art. So that is um, where the name, uh, the world's longest art gallery comes from. Um, and of those uh, stations, 24 of them are basically cave stations. Um, so those are the ones that you see a lot of photos of online um, and are sort of uh, really what people think of when they think of the uh, Stockholm Metro. So what exactly is a cave station? Um, as you can sort of see from this photo, uh, this kind of looks like what you would expect a cave to look like. Um, and some are very natural looking sort of like this and then others are completely uh, bright colored and have tiles and sculptures and all sorts of things that um, don't exactly look quite natural. So how exactly did these stations come to be? Um, a lot of the initial stations built in the system were either above ground or just uh, slightly underground built with sort of a cut and cover type construction um, system. And uh, as the city grew larger and uh, more stations were gonna be built, it was pretty obvious that displacing all the people and roads and everything that had grown up was not like something that was going to be feasible. So it was either going to be an elevated system or an underground system. And um, underground and sort of building the stations in this manner where uh, a lot of the walls were left pretty natural and not smoothed out and everything um, was really the more economical way to go. Um, although what you see on the walls looks like it's kind of natural, um, the rock formation uh, is actually covered with about a three inch layer of concrete, um, mostly just to uh, stabilize uh, the rock and then to prevent any uh, water from seeping in. So it's uh, as natural as you can sort of get it. Um, but these artists are all uh, in, uh, brought on fairly early on in the process and they work with uh, the engineers and architects to sort of 
form the, uh, the cave station that they imagine um, it to be. So why exactly have art on the subway anyway? Um, obviously the, the system is known for its art, but there's really four main reasons why um, art was sort of incorporated here. Um, firstly, it's memorable for visitor, visitors. I mean, I don't think everyone is going to be as crazy as I am to pretty much just visit Stockholm only for the uh, Tunnelbana, but um, there are a lot of people that do come and take rides and there's apps even that you can download for your phone um, that will guide you through like the different stations and, and take you on an interesting trip. Um, it's also interesting for daily commuters, obviously, uh, you know, before the pandemic, there were times where people would ride the train every day, multiple times a day. Um, and uh, it just provided something interesting for those people that were always on the train to see. Um, and then wayfinding is also a very important aspect of the art. Um, and when artist selections are, are coming up and artists pr uh, submit proposals, um, wayfinding is actually something that they're judged on. So um, it definitely helps in terms of uh, navigating through stations. Most of the cave stations were constructed with um, an exit on either end of the platform. So you'll find some stations that have, say, for example, a green exit and a black exit. Um, and you'll see the art on either end uh, with those different colors. So it helps uh, provide a visual cue so you know where you're going through the station. And then also culturally, um, art belonging to the people and uh, these being uh, public stations and public places, um, there should be art there. So let's, let's basically boil down uh, it, everything that I'm gonna show you today in the stations to three different main artistic themes. Um, firstly, aesthetically pleasing is pretty self-explanatory, but there were different, definitely artists um, that felt that because these were public uh, places, um, there shouldn't be anything controversial there. So you'll see a lot of uh, uh, art that is just pretty or engages curiosity or makes you feel a certain way, um, but really doesn't get into any uh, real social issues. Um, there's also historic references, whether that's um, art of the area, like these uh, runes in this mosaic, um, or basically what happened above ground. So the history of the neighborhoods in which the stations are built um, or different events that happened um, even when the stations themselves were being constructed. And then also there were some stations that did address social issues that artists felt that um, these things should be reflected. And when you ride the train, you should think about things um, and it should make you question uh, different things. So um, my work is basically photos uh, of basically different artists here in this uh, instance, um, but I do use uh, HDR or high dynamic range photography. Um, so for me, that's basically blending three different exposures um, of image to yield a balanced image. So I think that's sort of useful when you're shooting these cave stations where you have like the caves themselves, which are kind of dark. Um, and then you also have like these very bright lights over the platforms and stuff like that. Um, so it, it yields a balanced image. So here are three exposures from one photograph of uh, two seconds, a half second and eight seconds. Um, and then all of those are blended together. So the good thing about this system is that they do let you bring tripods um, as long as you're sort of not interrupting um, people's uh, transit. Um, so I pretty much went to all of these stations very late at night um, when there were fewer people um, and I wasn't going to interrupt anybody. 
Um, and then I try to get a lot of moving trains through the shots. Um, so that's where that eight second exposure sort of comes in. And to me, the holy grail was really um, getting part of the exposure with the train moving. Um, and then the other part of the exposure where there was no train in the frame at all. So that sort of yields this um, ghostly image of this moving train, but you also get to see what the art looked like behind that moving train. Um, so the, the first station that we're gonna talk about is uh, Te Centralen, which is uh, the main train station um, where all of the subway lines come through. And then also above ground, there is the uh, main, uh, long distance rail station for Stockholm. So this is actually that photo that I showed you uh, the three exposures for, um, what that sort of looks like uh, combined. But um, this is one of the examples of a station where we weren't going to have anything that was overwhelmingly controversial. It's uh, pretty much blue and white and it's got these uh, vine imagery um, over the ceiling and the walls. And the, the artist's goal was, as I said, not to be controversial, but to try and make you feel calm. So you've got this really busy station, but the blues and the vines and the plants and everything are supposed to make you feel calm in this uh, middle of chaos. And uh, the wayfinding is uh, built into this as well. So you see, this is one of the uh, exits um, and you'll see that the uh, white uh, ceiling is above the exit. Um, here's another exit with the, the white color as well. So pretty much if you're looking for an exit you, in the station, you're gonna look for the white. And then here are the trains, uh, the train platform, you're gonna look for the blue. So you, you know where to go, um, whether you want a train or whether you want an exit. So you look for those colors. Um, Vostroskogen is another station where um, it was pretty much just made to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, there's some uh, ambiguity here in that you can see some railings and uh, molding and stuff like that, where if you stand in certain places, it might look like a face. Um, but other than these things, it's really just supposed to be bright and uh, colorful. So the cave itself, however, is very natural looking. It's, it's natural and the real juxtaposition that captures your interest is this natural looking cave, but also these really brightly colored tiles that are incorporated. Um, and you'll see those tiles uh, up the sides of the uh, stairwell here. And then you'll also see some really brightly colored red doors. So you've got these pops of color with the natural looking cave. Um, and then here is another uh, tile uh, sort of sculpture on the wall, which um, obviously looks like an arrow, but it's not the typical arrow that you would expect. Um, so although it points the way out, it also sort of engages your curiosity. And then here is the area on the platform, which I really liked, where there were a lot of really bright colors, um, which just looked nice next to the trains. Um, Morby Centrum is another where there's not a lot really going on in terms of meaning, but it really does uh, hammer home the idea of wayfinding in the stations. Um, so when you get off the, uh, the train here, you're going to notice um, there's like this little camouflage pattern with uh, pink um, and gray, uh, greenish gray um, colors. So here's me uh, standing on the platform, like looking straight up. And this is what the pattern looks, at, looks like when you're looking straight at it. Um, however, if you stand in one direction, you tend to notice more pink. And if you stand in the other direction, you tend to no notice more gray. Um, so it provides a really nice way to basically give somebody directions or to know whether you're going to the exit that you intend to be going to. And then here's basically a, a train waiting to pick up some passengers. 
um, where you're looking uh, in that pink direction. Um, and then you'll also find some uh, tile work in this station as well, which uh, looks kind of pretty. So one of the more interesting stations that you'll find in the system is Kungstergarden. Um, it shows a lot of different things that um, were going on above ground um, in terms of that history aspect. Um, so you'll notice that the floors are uh, white and red and green, um, and that sort of references the colors that you would have seen above ground. Um, there was a, a, a Baroque pleasure garden above, which um, pretty much just means that there were uh, plants and things that you could go and see, but there were also um, sort of rides and uh, theaters and, and things that were sort of added into that park to make it um, a place where people would wanna to go to and bring their kids and, and everything like that. Um, and then there was also the uh, Makalos Palace um, above ground, um, which uh, sort of uh, incorporates um, these things that you'll see on the wall. So um, those faces um, were really uh, re uh, reproductions of things that you would have seen on that palace, um, which burned down in, uh, I believe it was uh, 1825. Um, the other thing to notice here is that there is some natural rock. So when I said that all of the stations have this layer of uh, concrete uh, blown onto them. Um, there is one exception and it is here. So part of the, uh, one of the good things about having the artists sort of engaged early in the process is that they can work with those engineers and uh, architects to sort of mold that station the way they really want it. So this particular artist really wanted to um, show some of that natural rock um, and they were able to build, build the station um, in such a way where it was actually able to have a little bit shown here. Um, and another interesting part of this station is that it was expanded. So the original portion was built in 1977 um, and then in 1987 um, it was added on to. And so the original artist actually came back to um, add on to the station. Um, and this is the uh, passageway that uh, goes towards that new area. And another section of that passageway. And then here's the new area of the station. So um, you'll notice some really cool things. Um, like these uh, lanterns that are on the wall. So um, this station, along with uh, one of the museums in Stockholm, actually brought some of the artifacts um, from the area. So these uh, lanterns used to be above ground um, and they were gas lanterns, um, but they were converted into electric and brought down here. So you can actually see them as part of the station. But the really noteworthy part about this section is that um, it was a, a commentary about the Chernobyl disaster. Um, so 1986 um, was when that happened. So this was built a year afterward. Um, and there was a lot of concern in Europe at the time, especially about uh, food and contamination and all of that sort of thing. And, um, uh, milk had to be thrown away because you didn't want anybody to drink it because of the contamination. Um, so you'll see some of those fears illustrated in the ceiling, like the, uh, the body of a person um, or what a sausage looked like. It's like, is this sausage even safe to eat? Like um, just these worries that were on everybody's mind, um, you'll see sort of memorialized here. Um, Stadion is a really fun station, and if you've ever seen photos of uh, the Tunnelbana online, it's possible that you've seen this station. Um, it's pretty memorable because it's got this really bright uh, rainbow, which is lots of colors, um, and it just captures a lot of people's attention. Um, and then there's also these uh, brightly colored wooden sculptures that sort of point the way in different directions. 
Um, for example, this S points to the exit where the stadium is. Um, and the, the brightly colored rainbow is in the, uh, the center of the platform, and then the rest is pretty much all blue. Um, but you will notice that there's uh, these little uh, circular things next to the rainbow there. Um, those are actually the crests of several bandy teams. Um, and they used to play their championship um, above ground in that stadium. Uh, so bandy is a, a sport that's pretty popular uh, in that area. Um, it's, I would say, a combination of mostly hockey and a little bit of soccer. Um, and it, instead of using a puck, it's a little ball and uh, the size of the rink is way bigger, closer to soccer size than hockey size. Um, Radhuset is also um, another interesting station that sort of uh, incorporates history into the mix. Um, so the artist wanted to basically make the color look natural. And um, he felt that the color looked like what he saw when he was in the uh, Atlas Mountains. Um, so although that is pretty natural, some of the things that you'll see within the stations um, aren't quite natural. So um, most noteworthy is uh, this uh, uh, chimney basically right here. And uh, the chimney is um, representative of a factory that used to be above ground um, that produced a lot of uh, different materials over the years, um, but was really noteworthy because of this smoking chimney that you know, could be seen for miles around. So really what the artist imagines is sort of like an archeological dig that you're exploring when you're down here riding the train um, and what would have happened if all of these historical artifacts from the, uh, the factories and the markets and everything above ground um, sort of sunk down and reappeared in this station. Um, and this is, uh, one of the exits and uh, I just had a little fun with uh, my fisheye lens. I don't know why I like the fisheye lens, but for some reason, uh, I always enjoyed shooting with it. Um, Sundaysburg Centrum also incorporates um, a little bit of history. Um, the different uh, materials of buildings that were built above sort of were reflected down here. Um, the cave itself is pretty natural looking, except for random ears and other body parts that you might find on it. Um, but there's also different colored materials that you'll see that are uh, supposed to be reflective of materials that were used to build above ground. Um, and this is one of the uh, rare photos that you'll see in this presentation that actually has people in it. And that is uh, my husband and I uh, sitting on the escalator there. Um, but one of the interesting ways that history was incorporated um, were buildings and structures that were going to be uh, demolished above ground. The materials were taken and brought down here and reused. Um, to build uh, these sculptural elements. Um, so it was an, an interesting way to uh, bring that history down into the station. And uh, here's a, a close up of some of those uh, materials that were reused. Um, Temsta is an interesting station in that uh, the artist didn't exactly have a complete idea of what she wanted to make um, when she was uh, painting on the walls here. So uh, she went down and sort of uh, put lights onto the uh, cave uh, structure and sort of looked at the shadows and the light and sort of painted what she thought those structures looked like to her. Um, so here we've got this uh, big woolly mammoth um, that sort of looks like it would appropriately be down in the uh, natural looking cave. Um, and then there's also some uh, plant life that you'll see on the walls here. Um, and suns and, and different imagery like suns and plants. Um, 
And then there's also uh, some quotes and things that were uh, incorporated here um, on the walls from poetry and uh, different things. Um, and one of the sort of uh, social commentaries that this station brings up is environmentalism. So um, the translation of that quote is, we must build a viable world for us today and for future generations. Um, and there's also some uh, fun penguins on the wall with another quote from the uh, Havamal. The young fur that falls and rots, having neither needles nor bark, so is the fate of the friendless man. Why should he live long? Um, and probably the penguins were, were my favorite part of this station. Um, but it also uh, brings in the uh, concept of uh, immigration. So this area um, has a lot of uh, immigrants. And so um, all these uh, posters on the wall have uh, the translations in different languages um, of those immigrants uh, saying either the word uh, brotherhood or sisterhood or siblinghood, depending on the language and what word it has, um, just uh, sort of representing a, a solidarity um, with uh, these immigrants. Universitet is uh, an interesting station in that um, the art here was designed in 1998. Um, the original station was built in the 70s, like most of these other cave stations. However, um, there, were, uh, there was some water damage and flooding down here um, that prompted the station to close for repairs. Um, and the art was not recoverable. So it was redone in 1998 by a different artist. Um, and it's pretty noteworthy because you'll see these uh, really brightly green colored doors um, with other funky colored tiles. Um, but everybody seems to remember these uh, figures of these uh, stick figures running um, on the emergency exits. Um, but you'll also see uh, behind that, there are some tiles on the wall where the train is. Um, and that is uh, basically written out different parts of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so that's all written on the wall there. But really what I liked, I think, was the uh, juxtaposition of the brightly colored tiles and what you would expect uh, the natural rock to look like. Um, and you'll see a lot of those uh, brightly colored tiles, the, the blue and the yellow here, um, and the blue and the green by the exit. And then of course, the uh, funky running men, which I tried to incorporate into a bunch of different photos. Um, when it comes to sort of incorporating um, different social commentaries, I would say uh, Solna Centrum is probably one of the, the main stations that you would think of. Um, so some of the uh, artists did want to be a little bit controversial or uh, sort of make you think while you're riding the train. Um, and so the, the main concept that you'll see here is uh, the thought of uh, deforestation. So um, back to that sort of wayfinding idea, you have half of the station, which uh, is green with trees. Um, and then you'll also see black with uh, buildings where those trees no longer are. Um, but the probably the most fun part of the station here is this uh, glass enclosure. And there's a couple of different enclosures like this um, at the station. But uh, most memorable to me was this one of the White House, um, and that's the American White House. Um, and there's a little uh, helicopter that is hard to see in the photo, um, but this is uh, representative of basically when Richard Nixon resigned his presidency and took the helicopter off uh, from the South Lawn and basically left. Um, and it's sort of all surrounded by these uh, houses sort of representing the, uh, the people sort of watching these uh, events unfold. Um, and there's also a little guy playing a guitar and a quote, um, the times are a changing. 
um, referencing the uh, Bob Dylan song. And you'll see this exit here has the, uh, the trees on the one end of the platform and uh, a nice little picture of what those trees look like uh, on the platform. And uh, the opposite side, what the, the black side looks like. So what, what sort of happens in the future? Um, you know, we have these hundred stations. There haven't been a lot that have been added recently, um, but there is a lot of work sort of going on to build the next generation of the Stockholm Metro. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your opinion, um, cave stations aren't really going to be part of that future. So largely that was, you know, the era of the 70s. And, um, you know, the, the idea is to sort of make everything that's new look like it's new, like you're stepping into a station from 2025 or uh, whatever year that um, they're, they're going to be finished and open to the public. So one of the extensions is going to be on one end of the blue line to Barkerby, um, and then the other end to Naka. Um, there's going to be a little bit of a rerouting of the, uh, the, what was the green line, and it's going to be part of the blue line now. Um, there's going to be a new yellow line. Um, and then there's going to be another line added after that. The uh, color has not yet been determined. Um, but the yellow line was voted upon, and so I assume that this line will be uh, open to the public to vote on what color that's going to be. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be new stations added along all of those lines. So um, for pretty much all of them, artists have been selected, and there are uh, various um, proposals and renderings that you can see online to sort of see the next generation of the uh, Stockholm Metro. And although caves are not really going to be incorporated, um, the construction method is largely the same. So depending on the artist, um, some are going to completely cover that over, but there's two examples here where you can sort of see uh, what the, the cave structure looked like, but it's really not the main focus as uh, the previous stations that I showed you. Um, so Hagastaden is a really uh, interesting station, um, and I'm not going to say too much here, but uh, the artist uh, is a feminist artist that likes to incorporate um, different images uh, that represent childbirth into her art. Um, and so uh, this large vault of a, an open area reminded her of uh, the protection of the womb. And um, that's sort of uh, played upon with the uh, imagery of a shell. So um, the womb protects the baby and the, uh, the shell protects a pearl inside. Um, and you'll see uh, it's very pink. Um, and Barkaby Sodden is uh, gonna be another really interesting one um, where this uh, first area is uh, gonna just have some quotes and writings on the floor. Um, but when you get down to the uh, platform level, you're really going to start incorporating some of the uh, new technologies of the day. So um, this station is built um, below what was um, an airport. Um, and uh, so you get this cloud theme from that, but the, the wall of the platform is actually going to be a video wall. So that's going to um, change based on the time of day and the weather sort of showing the clouds um, in different ways based on uh, the time of day that you're visiting. And then uh, Barkaby really sort of incorporates that new look of these stations. So instead of having dark caves, you're going to have really bright um, light stations. Um, and this is definitely underground. Um, but because of that light, you may think that you are not underground. Um, and in addition to the artists that are sort of designing everything, um, lighting designers are, are brought into the mix. And so it sort of um, 
shows this new era of station um, that is uh, majorly uh, taking light into account. Um, and this, this station here, uh, Arena Staden, um, totally goes away from the, the cave aesthetic. So it's all hidden here. Um, and although you might think that uh, this is sort of an abstract um, view of uh, these tiles on the wall, um, the, the four artists that make up the uh, collective that designed the station actually went to the neighborhood um, and took photos of uh, some of the colorful apartment blocks and then uh, blew those images up really, really big. Um, and so the tiles that you see are actually the individual pixels of uh, some of those uh, photos. Um, and then last, lastly, Sodra Hagelund um, sort of incorporates a different way of looking at light. And so uh, the ceramic artist that uh, designed this station um, wanted to incorporate um, glass uh, and uh, different ceramics that light could be aimed through. Um, and sort of the underlying concept was imagining different train stations um, like old train stations. And I'm sure you've seen photos of Grand Central where the light sort of filters through the windows and, and forms shapes um, on the ground. Um, and that was really the idea of uh, the look that formed this station. Um, so I'm really looking forward to um, seeing what these new stations are gonna be like. And I'm gonna have to uh, go back to Stockholm at some point in time um, to take a look at what they all look like uh, when they're completed, hopefully soon. Um, and that's it. So if there's any questions, if there's time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily. Wow, that is absolutely stunning. I'm, I'm a, it's astounding how thoughtful and intentional the builders were and how personal they were, and particularly with some st uh, stations about incorporating Swedish history and culture, but even on a more micro scale, the neighborhood um, aesthetics. It's, yeah, just breathtaking. Um, so, yeah, if, if anyone has any questions for Emily, put them in the Q&A. It looks like we have about seven minutes that we can devote to to questions, um, and I'll, I'll just start us off. Um, I know you you said that you went mostly at night so you could get um, your, your pictures taken when you could have fewer people fewer, get in the way of fewer commuters. Um, but with so many different sorts of installations that deal with different parts of Swedish culture and history, how do you how did you see people interacting with them on a day to day basis? Um, largely, I was there at night, so there weren't as many people um, and people tended to sort of stay away from me, I think, because they saw me with the um, the tripod and everything like that. Um, and I probably shouldn't say this, but um, when there were sort of people in the area, my husband was sort of like walking around looking like a crazy person. And then people really did want to stay away from me. Um, <laughs> but it was a really nice way to not get any people in the shot. Um, I didn't publicly admit that. Um, but it was interesting to see um, the way that people sort of uh, looked at everything. Um, and you could see that some were, were very clearly tourists. And then, you know, obviously late at night, some people uh, that clearly live there uh, coming back from the bar and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it probably would be even more interesting to see these days because when I had been there, um, I don't think there was as much documentation that was public about what all of the art meant. Um, and now, like I had mentioned, um, there, there's like an app that you can download so you can see like in real time um, what everything means. Um, and, you know, I think there was a lot of stuff that I missed that I didn't even know about at the time. Right. So um, just seeing that sort of interaction um, and I, I think it would be more interesting now, honestly, though. Yeah, right. No, I mean, I'm being able to understand it at, at the intention that the artists had it or how they designed and intend, like hopefully intended that people would interact with that. Um, did you have one or two favorite stations? That's a good question. Um, I, I probably liked the, the rainbow station just cause it was such, so brightly colored. I think it was definitely fun. Um, but also uh, uh, Kungster Garden with uh, 
the, the new section and just a lot of different things to sort of explore. And I, I love the idea of um, incorporating like real life artifacts from museums that were brought down um, to become part of the station. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned um, you were maybe interested in, in going back in the future. Any any plans on the calendar yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, there aren't any plans on the calendar, um, but uh, I'm sort of, uh, you know, watching when these stations are going to be built. I think um, they did get a little bit delayed because of the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. but hopefully uh, some of the uh, the newer stations on the uh, the blue line extension and the yellow line um, should be opening within the next couple of years. Yeah. Emily, I just wanted to share my great appreciation for your presentation and sharing it with us today. It's just fantastic. And um, know that you have a standing offer for a follow-up article in Robert Heritage uh, after <laughs> you've made that next visit. <laughs> so, um, All righty, I, I will do that at some point in time. Fantastic. I know, um, so it's I know a long that I... time for me to uh, do this first article. You had been asking me for quite a while, so it was well worth yeah. the wait. <laughs> yeah, though I, I think if you if you put it to the staff, I there'd be a, a heavy contingent that would be interested in hearing more about the cat train. <laughs> <laughs> Animals are very popular in uh, all aspects of our our, our work yeah. at the center. <laughs> Emily, I'm curious too if you have any uh, other projects that you're working on right now. Um, right now, I sort of have this this book in mind that I'm really wanting to work towards. So um, I really want to sort of uh, display the the concept of then and now. Mm. Um, and part of uh, the Harlem line uh, was abandoned. Um, and so there, there really isn't any rail infrastructure there anymore. And um, even in areas where there is still rail infrastructure, you know, you can go back on maps and see, well, there used to be this giant rail yard here, and now there's like two tracks or whatever. Um, so I'm working on uh, making maps and um, taking photos just to sort of uh, display um, that concept of what things used to look like and what they look like today. Mm. Fantastic. Well, we'll look forward to that, too. Yeah, definitely. And it looks like we got one question that came in through the queue. Someone's curious about how maybe the train sounded differently in some of those different stations, I guess, when you're thinking about some of the cave stations, which may absorb some of the sound versus some of those ones that have the tile and other sorts of mixed media that's um That's a good question. I, I don't really remember any difference of sound, but now that that question is in my mind, I'll, I'll have to pay attention if I ever do go back. Yeah, that's a interesting thing to, or topic to think about. Um, yeah. Well, it doesn't look like we have anything else coming up, but if anyone thinks of anything over the um, even next few minutes or the next few hours, next few days, I'm going to drop again that post event Q and A form in the chat. Sometimes I know it takes. A while for questions to incubate. So if you have a question for Emily um, that you think of a little bit later, feel free to ask it in that form and we will again send that out to our presenters and have any follow-up questions. Oh, do you have something? I, in I just have a quick one and I'm sorry if I missed this, but uh, Emily, are there any stations in the U.S. that you would say compare to mm -hmm. what you're seeing in those cave stations? Is there anything that even comes close? Not that I can think of, honestly. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, other stations um, throughout the world, I think, um, don't incorporate the artist very early on, too. So it feels like art is a little bit of an afterthought, um, whereas, you know, this these stations really brought it to the forefront. And um, it's it's throughout the entire thing. So just that aspect, I think, even um, makes it very different than a lot of other transit systems. Mm -hmm. And if we have time for one more, um, Michael Schmidt asked on the Q&A, if you have an interest in other transportation stations, uh, for example, the growing evolution of airport terminal design, or if there's anything, other modes that catch your eye. <laughs> so um, many folks know that I uh, used to work for Amtrak for quite a while. Um, and then uh, during the pandemic got laid off and I got hired by um, an engineering firm um, and I've been flying a lot more than taking trains recently. So I sort of uh, got interested actually in planes and sort of uh, 
seeing the uh, the different aspects of play. And so um, just observing that I think is interesting. Um, and then I've also gotten a couple of cool chances to go behind the scenes because uh, my company has worked on some of the, uh, the airport's building. So um, getting to see that has definitely been cool, but um, I don't intend to change my blog to uh, anything about flying anytime soon. <laughs> You won't be writing for airline heritage, I guess. <laughs> no, but there there is a post where I took pictures of transit, uh, like tracks and everything from planes when they were taking off. So that might be the closest that you're going to get for now. Um, well, with that, uh, blog is called I Ride the Harlem Line, uh, harlemline.com. <laughs> <laughs>